Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science. In this episode we're going to be dealing with the concept of being unequally yoked and in layman's terms what we're really talking about there is in a relationship are you sort of first in the relationship are you second in terms of the relationship or are you sort of on an equal footing with one another now um, I posted this analysis on October 7th um, on Crime Rocket um, it was one of the least uh, visited stories that I put up I think it's the sort of thing where people say um, you know you you talking nonsense this is all just your opinion and speculation right where we are now in terms of the third confession um, there's a lot of detail that's come out about um, Nicole Kessinger feeling like she was second right what's really interesting with that is it's not um, unique to the third confession you actually see it um, repeated in the discovery documents where um, Chris Watts literally uses the word um, um, second fiddle that, that um, Kessinger felt she was playing second fiddle to Shanann and um, Kessinger herself also texted a friend and saying uh, you know she wonders whether she's going to be coming second so this is actually a vital area and not only that it's such a sort of obvious area which is in a situation where someone is married and there's a third party and and, and um, this party is cheating with uh, one of the you know spouses you're going to have by definition a situation of being unequally yoked in other words um, the fact that the person wants to conduct an affair means that there's there's some sort of um, seesaw going on where, where one person isn't feeling they're getting what they want and you know while someone is having the affair they they are getting something I guess on the side which is obviously um, you know um, not good for the let's call it the innocent party or the aggrieved party and so this whole concept of being unequally yoked is really really important as I say um, this this article even though it was posted in October no one was particularly interested in it I guess uh, people thought at the time so what you know so what um, you know so, so what does this have to do with the the Watts case and what does this have to do with what happened um, everything so it got everything to do with it and once again um, if you don't want to think about Nicole Kessinger as a person and you don't want to think about any of these people as people th then it's best you don't think about this because real people care about the sense of being you know am I first or am I second you know are you treating me as an equal or are you treating treating me am I playing second fiddle now I understand um, I, I kind of understand the psychology where you're looking into a case and you don't really care about that you don't care how X Y Z was playing second fiddle but I can guarantee you in your own life and in your own relationship you care the most about that in other words the most important thing to you is how much um, value um, someone that you love gives you and you expect to be valued and you expect to be treated a certain way um, obviously in the we, we, when you start thinking about that in terms of another person it means absolutely nothing so what if Chris Watts wasn't treated with much respect well you know you can make that argument um, but then then don't try and understand this case don't read books about it and don't I mean what are people doing here um, it, unless it's just sort of figure out what is really going on and so I find it pretty sort of laughable that that you sort of if you actually look at this article that I posted it was it was enormous it was a, a really big article and like as I said nobody was interested um, 
I think because because Chris Watts has had a chance to sort of speak for himself, and also because um, the details around Nicole Kessinger have been expanded upon, I think there's a, there's more of a concept now that wow, th- these were actually people, and they were there was some kind of dynamic involved. Um, I didn't really know that. I didn't really care, but now now I'm starting to notice. But as I say, this was um, published more than a year ago. And it was dealing with that with, with that dynamic. I'm going to go through the, the blog post. Um, what I'm going to do is, is I'm really using this as a primer for something else that I really want to talk about. Um, let me refer to it here as Detergate. And you'll understand why I call it that in the next episode. But it's essentially dealing with the um, conversations between... Um, Watts and Kessinger and Kessinger and others about the sense of priority. You know, am I, do I matter in this person's life? And, you know, people have been asking for such a long time, you know, why did this happen? Why didn't he get a divorce? Why did he have to kill his children? And, you know, why did he, why, why did he, he wanted a son? Why did he change his mind? And, well, this answers the question, but you've got to, be prepared to listen to these people to to get their version of it. So uh, we're going to deal with Tetergate um, and just just a little bit of information on that. Just as Nutgate was about nuts, Detergate was about Dita. It was about Dita leading Kessinger into the Watts home to, I guess, photos, family photos, and and this caused a kind of explosion right um, uh, in terms of um, what's his mistress so if there was nutgate then detergate is is almost like the the other side of the coin right anyway we will get to that um, but let's first deal with this whole idea of being unequally yoked and although we may think we know what that's all about we actually need to sort of try to spend a bit of time with it and try and suss it out um, just in terms of the the dimensions of it and um, just mentioning the word isn't really enough we've got to sort of uh, feel our way to that and we we want to use some specific things to do that so without any further ado let's let's get going being unequally yoked in the contemporary biblical sense means your marriage and relationship is doomed for disaster It's a catchy truism because it is true. Um, So, in a general sense, when when a relationship is unequally yoked, you can tell from sort of a mile away this isn't going to work. So, whether it's a relationship or a marriage or even an affair, if if you're in in an affair and it's feeling like it's unequally yoked in terms of from the outside or whatever then then that's also going to tell you a lot um, you know without needing um, a terrible amount of additional detail um, the origin of this epithet is commonly thought to be the Christian Bible and you often hear this idea of being unequally yoked amongst Christians you know if you're a Christian should you be with someone who's not a Christian you know that's unequally yoked um, So, but actually one of the oldest surviving recorded references to this unequal yoking business goes all the way back to Papyrus 46 from 175 AD, believe it or not. So this unequal yoking is something that's been with us throughout human history. It matters. It's um, something that has um, impacted families, societies, people forever and it also matters in this particular case. Um, the Bible doesn't have the monopoly over the idea even if, if, if it has monopolized the phrase over the centuries. Unequal yoking is rooted in the rise of agrarian societies about 10,000 years ago. Farming was a relatively new idea then like the wheel and our ancestors then were amateurs at pretty much everything. People had to be told not to yoke strong animals like an ox, say, with smaller, weaker beasts of burden, say, like donkeys. 
over time these prescripts achieved a symbolic importance and went from applying you know to effective farm animal management to marriage advice and you can think that it is pretty sound you know if you don't yoke these animals properly you create problems for both both of them so it, it just makes sense that both animals push or pull the same amount of weight and if you can um, if you can sort of organize that in a good way it's good for everyone it's good for the animals it's good for the equipment and it's good for the farm right you're going to have a, a long period of this system sort of functioning so equal yoking makes sense right um, so yeah you know coming back to this the reasoning is sound you know having a strong person such as someone with a strong faith in God married to a weak person an unbeliever was likely to cause your relationship to go around in circles and potentially unravel completely for example when you have you know one strong animal one weak animal you're going to have the strong animal sort of causing a situation where this this plow that is being pulled is, is going to start going you know off track it's no longer going to be a straight line and left to their own devices they are going to go in circles and get nowhere and you know it's going to create a mess um, well one can debate whether believers or unbelievers are stronger or weaker relative to one another uh, what's clear is the principle itself is sound people who are strikingly different to one another especially in their beliefs and orientations aren't likely to maintain strong relations uh, relationships happy with that so um, you know people have sort of used or championed this whole concept of narcissism so if you want to understand Chris Watts let's talk about narcissism he's a narcissist he just wanted everything that he wanted and that explains everything he's a narcissist right now if you bring that concept into this whole yoking business it doesn't actually apply at all right and what does apply is if you bring in the concept of introversion you you have a situation where you have and this is more in a psychological sense you have a person who is um, uh, a strong personal uh, personality or a controlling kind of person which is the same as like kind of a big ox in terms of pulling the plow and then you have another person who is more reserved and who's more quiet and who's more weak in in the view of the other person but in a psychological sense they are sort of quieter and but in terms of the yoking you are going to have an equal yoking and I don't really care you want to phrase this if you know, I don't really care you want to sort of dodge around it so if you want to say oh no but that's that's different the reality is if you were Shanann you want someone that you're married to who's going to stand up and be an equal in a sense and is going to be a strong person that takes charge and, and, and whatever it is so if you're going to argue that this sort of um, oh, oh, psychological um, yoking doesn't apply of course it does so if anything it's even more applicable where you're dealing with the personalities of people and um, you know are they both pulling their own weight or is the one um, you know um, enforcing themselves or whatever it is to excess or is the, the other one not right and and we can see that this is a classic case of that um, intuitively it's clear that Shannon and Chris Watts weren't equally yoked and given what happened to this family someone was pulling a heavier load someone found the burden they were carrying unfair in reality when animals pulling a plow are unequally yoked everyone is worse off as I've mentioned the stronger animal finds the yoke constantly chafing at its neck no matter how halting its pace the stronger animal finds its time is being wasted and its energy squandered as it waits in the field you know the Sun burning a hole on its back as it waits for its partner to catch up and marriages can feel the same the weaker animal is always being prodded pulled and pressured to exceed its own boundaries 
and the farm and the farmer suffer as a result of this mismatch. Everyone loses. The reality in a sort of yoking scenario is that the beasts kind of get forced to work together and if it's unpleasant for one of them it, it may be a lot more unpleasant for the other but they're kind of trapped in the sort of harness and the one that's having the harder time is having a much harder time and it's a much harder time on a daily basis which adds up the chafing gets worse the injury whatever you want to call it if it's psychological injury or, or um, physical injury but that sense of injury gets worse and worse and worse and the contempt for the strong in terms of the stronger animal also gets worse the resentment builds right so um, in the Watts case we have some idea now that issues of interiority were at play and we have some idea they had something to do with the obvious stuff that impacts all relationships financial pressures work life home life family dynamics etc by applying symbolic sp uh, specificity to our interrogation I realize that's a big word but what I mean is just being symbolic about specific things um, we're going to get a lot closer to the operative psychology in the Watts case these sound like really highbrow concepts but once you once you actually sort of deal with them they very very familiar so saying something like symbolic specificity <laughs> um, don't don't sort of be put off by that it's just simply a way of saying we're not going to be specific about certain aspects um, so when we do that we ask a question like how did unequal yoking affect the MLM side of things Another question is, was sexuality or, or sexual orientation relevant? How about temperament? Finances? What impact does an affair have on how one is yoked inside a marriage? So let's start examining these one by one using the implement of unequal yoking as a guide and a benchmark. So let's start with um, the, these, the companies that, that these two people worked for. The one worked for Lavelle, another one worked for Anadarka. Would working for these companies create any kind of yoking scenario? And another way to sort of think about it is <coughs> you have two animals and they both under kind of the same yoke. It's not, it's not technically the same yoke, but for the sake of this argument, let's say that it is. But on the one side you kind of have um, one person um, which is the one which is the company that the one works for holding the, a whip and on the other side you have the other company that the other one works for holding a whip and so this is also going to have an impact on the, the yoking um, and you know how we get to that is we start seeing does Lavelle place any demands on the other spouse right on the other sort of teammate and then if you go to the other one does Anadarko place any demands on the other spouse and I think it's quite obvious the one places a lot of demands on the on the other one to sort of show up and to do X Y and Z and go on go go to events and to play ball whereas the other one places absolutely no demands um, you know, just looking at the optics, Lavelle feels like a vibrant, colorfully branded, socially active um, party in terms of this whole game. There are exotic trips, um, cakes and chocolates, um, or, or cake-flavored um, bars or whatever it is, luxury cars and the convenience and fun of making hay from home, you know, building your business empire one Facebook Live video at a time. And a dark, on the other hand, feels gritty and dirty. It involves physical work, outdoors, um, with hazardous chemicals, dust, grease and grime. It's not colorful work unless one counts oil and rust as colors. It's not social either unless one considers a screwdriver, rigs, nuts and bolts as companions. Unlike the relative variety at Lavelle, an operator's work is stock standard. It's the same deal, the same equipment every day. It's get the oil to where it needs to go. 
What we can say with some confidence then is that the stay-at-home job is quite cushy and clean and comfortable. Uh, it's even easy compared to the upper dawn siege that is plying one's living as an entry-level operator in the oil business. In the work sense, in terms of what they did each day, were Shannon and Chris Watts a little unequally yoked or a lot? Number two, temperament. Shanann appears to have evolved from her high school days um, from a shy, awkward and picked on kid to an attractive go-getter who got herself a house by age 25 and three children in spite of her health challenges with lupus. In 2018 her temperament seems to have gone from being relatively withdrawn to unfailingly gung-ho about thriving and even pushy about it. It's fair to say then that Shanann's temperament transformed a great deal during their marriage. Thrive was making her more and more of an extrovert and perhaps less and less of the woman Chris Watts thought he married. Chris Watts on the other hand seems to have remained straight as an arrow as a former college friend described him on HLN. Even during his marriage Shanann describes him as an introvert and in her videos he's always in the background and never says much. You think that's good for the whole thrive scenario? You think it's good if you're trying to sort of wave the the, the vibrant flag of thriving when, when someone doesn't really want to even be in the picture? Do you think it might be frustrating for one or the other person in that that situation? Um, Shanann's social media compared to Chris Watts's social media is like chalk and cheese. One might argue this stands to reason because she had to be active on social media. True, but Chris Watts also signed up to Lavelle. In more ways than one, he appeared to be a silent partner in the way they were yoked to Lavelle. The most we see of Chris Watts unfiltered isn't anywhere on Facebook. It's his notorious sermon on the porch. In that moment, he doesn't appear to be particularly introverted, but that seems to be an act for the cameras borne out later by how poorly the public decided he'd accounted for himself. By contrast, Scott Peterson was a better and more charming liar. In the temperamental sense, and this is really only limited to um, Shanann's growing extroversion versus his ongoing introversion, uh, were Shanann and Chris Watts a little unequally yoked or a lot? So bear in mind we're only dealing with, with just the introversion, extroversion aspect in terms of temperament. There, there are many other aspects to deal with. Now we go into finances and I also want to do actually a series of videos just dealing with the finances. It's kind of the untold story of not just the Watts case but particularly the Sh Shanann side of the equation. It's the unspoken truth of the of this whole story is is what was the state of Shanann's finances really right um, the finances remain a critically important area and even now where we are today a year later um, still a known unknown now bear in mind I wrote this blog post in October 2018 at that time it was a known unknown and it remains a known unknown. We know how precarious the finances were in 2015 and that then Chris Watts was carrying by far the bulk of the financial burden despite the acquisition of an expensive house and new babies on the way. Um, but we get a, another sense of the scale and scope of the financial burden from this article by the Denver Post. Um, just to highlight a few aspects, the Post describes bank bankruptcy records revealing a series of financial setbacks. It also refers to the Watts's filing for bankruptcy two years after moving into their five bedroom, 4,177 square foot home and you know that they paid almost 400,000 for the home according to public records. It goes on to um, highlight how the Watts 
family, how, how the Watts um, couple listed their assets when they were in trouble. They had creditors that included Ford Motor Company and Toys R Us. Um, their list of assets included their home, but also a 2006 Ford Mustang with almost 100,000 miles on it, wedding rings, and they even valued their dog at $5. Um, in June 2015, they reported they had $9.51 in their savings account and about $860 in their checking account. Um, debts include $11,245 in student loans. Now, I've copped quite a lot of flack in another video where I mentioned Shanann was a nurse and people were sort of very upset about that. She wasn't a nurse. And so then you can ask, well, what, what was the $11,000 in student loans about? What was she studying? Because let's be clear, she wasn't a nurse. So, so what was she? What were those student loans all about? So in other words, let's scratch, let's draw a line through the fact that she was a nurse and that she worked in a call center. We won't even go into that. What were these student loans about for $11,000? hello hi can can someone answer that question the people that are saying that she wasn't a nurse so what was she studying that that, that got this debt of eleven thousand dollars maybe some people can leave a comment about that you know what that's what the student loans were about um, because it wasn't about nursing though um, so so please anyone that that mentions anything about student loans having something to do with nursing that's that's not going to be on the table okay thanks okay so then we go to the um, another bill which is for choice recovery and that was for seven hundred and forty dollars for health and chiropractic services and yeah we're already getting a kind of a little little glimpse into just in terms of the money we're seeing that there's this there is this this the scenario being unequally yoked and um, that's this is why I say the the finances are a, a huge gaping hole in the watch story because if you want to snap your fingers and get um, a quick um, confirmation of just the scale of, 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 of the unequal yoking the easy way is to look at what were the bills of this person and what were the bills of that person what is the income of this person what is the income of that person who had the study loans of eleven thousand dollars? What about the other person? What what were their study loans? And on paper, you're going to get a very very quick um, uh, answer as to you know which one is creating the greater burden. And you know, in our society, in human society, if you're talking about unequally yoked, and you're talking about the reality of that in the sort of spiel of you know, two animals pulling a, cl a, a plow. I can tell you now, as much as you don't care about the financial burdens of other people, and you, you couldn't really give a crap about the financial burdens of the Wattses, I can guarantee you, you do give a crap about your own financial burdens. You give, you care a lot about your partners uh, relative to yours, and it's probably the main source of conflict in any marriage in any relationship it's how much someone is causing you to work harder or unnecessarily relative to their work and their contribution so as much as someone else's means absolutely nothing to you um, it means a heck of a lot in terms of those people and again I can see why people weren't interested in reading the this particular post because it requires you to think about someone else rather than projecting yourself constantly onto them which has been happening all this time and as I said with these projections it's all it's all about narcissism so th the reason that all of this is happening is narcissism <laughs> it's so simplistic and it's so silly um, and I hope that, that people who are listening to this, who are, are being somewhat evangelized in, in the reality of it, are going to, to hold others accountable for the absolute nonsense they are talking when they, when they refer to this 
narcissism stuff. Please, when you come across someone saying it, uh, tell them that they are that they don't know what they're talking about. Okay, that they can go and talk about w their stuff somewhere else where people have um, insensible conversations. But if you want to talk intelligently about it, then 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 you have intelligent conversations. So once again, we ask the question. Is it likely the finances had improved or worsened after three years and after Shanann's success as a MLM promoter? I just want to come back to this question and I want to be, I want to sort of slow it down and be quite specific. Is it likely the finances had improved or worsened after three years, after the bankruptcy in 2015, and after Shanann's success, and this is in inverted commas, as a MLM promoter? So, th I know there are some people who um, look at Shanann's Facebook and they say, that's the reality. She was an incredibly successful businesswoman. Look at the car she was driving. Look at the big house they were living in. She was successful, right? Um, so, I if it was such a successful, happy picture, why would they need to leave their home? And why would there be any arguments whatsoever? Why would there be a even a need to control the finances? So I don't understand these arguments where people sort of say that, you know, you make the case that, that something couldn't have been going that great. And then people say, no, no, things were absolutely wonderful. Oh, so they were so wonderful and then you had a murder. And the murder just doesn't make any sense. Th that, th that kind of argument um, is for um, sort of kindergarten true crime where you say, None of these things that you're talking about make any sense, okay, but the murder, and then the murders happen, Chris Watts is a narcissist and a monster. That's not an explanation. So, um, the answer is, you know, if the finances had worsened, then someone was either a little more unequally yoked or a lot. And who do you think that might be? I'm going to ask the question again. If the finances had worsened, then someone in the situation was either a little more unequally yoked or a lot. And who do you think that might be? Number four, the yoke of another pregnancy. Okay, and this is a, a really big one. Um, you can actually imagine in a scenario where a couple aren't that happy together and then, and then you add a pregnancy to the mix, you're going to just by definition create unequal yoking because the mother is is um, forced to be committed to being a mother and to the child that she's carrying she's uh, she's sort of she's locked in so she's totally yoked to that scenario whereas the man if he sort of changes his mind and in this case someone did then you have the situation of one person who's totally yoked another one who's totally not yoked and doesn't want to be yoked, right? That's the epitome of what we're talking about here. Um, one is the impression from Shanann that she thought she couldn't and wouldn't ever have children because of her health challenges. That's one thing, but what if her husband thought this, the same thing? You know, what if he got married assuming there wouldn't be any kids or, or there wouldn't be many kids, right? Did he have any say in the conception of his third child? Now bear in mind, this was something that I wrote in early October. Um, and as much as one can query this question, it has turned out to be true, but in another way. And, and what we're talking about here is, even though what's wanted uh, a child at the time, did he want the child shortly after? And the answer is no. So, so did he have any say in the conception of his third child? Well, he had a say in the conception, but what about the the aftermath? Um, and you know, in Shanann's pregnancy video, he appears to be happy initially, but a moment later, when he steps back and asks, "So pink means it's going to be girls," um, his surprise seems darker and more burdened. It's quite an interesting comment that he made, based on what we know now. You know that that he was like, you know, th does it mean 
it's going to be goals it doesn't mean there's going to be another goal in the house and that's kind of a whole different kettle of fish when you're talking about unequally yoked um, I'm not going to go into that any further but it's probably just worth thinking about um, off camera Shanann's voice sounds clipped as if she's putting him on the spot well isn't she isn't she sort of saying to him you know are you going to be yoked with me in this and she's totally entitled to be asking that and does he seem like he wants to be I mean he might have put his hand up and said let's have another child but it seems like immediately when when the child was conceived that didn't seem like a great idea um, does a pregnancy in this case a third child on the way add to the level of burden in a family that's already burdened already unequally yoked or subtract from it does a pregnancy add to the burden or subtract from it this is an interesting question because for one spouse there may be the idea that the burden will be lessened on them what about the other and this brings us to number point number five game versus no game when Shanann told her friend and colleague Amanda Thayer that Chris had no game she meant in the romantic sense when Thayer remarked on this sitting beside her own husband she laughs derisively whether Shanann is correct or not is less relevant than the inference according to Shanann she had game her thrive spiels are endlessly about her gameness and he didn't what is it like to hear that though I mean if you're the donkey in the equation what's it like to be stepped on squeezed and dragged along by the ox and told you have no game you are X Y or Z now there's a fairly recent video um, and I know one video doesn't make an argument but there's a fairly um, interesting video where Shanann seems to be making some kind of coffee or cafe or something like that and the whole family is together and it's quite a recent video and you see both children and, and Chris Watts is sort of in the background and what's really interesting with the video is you see Shanann holding the cup for everybody to smell she smells it Bella smells it and Cece smells it but she doesn't offer it to her husband um, you also see her sort of taking kind of a video of herself in the frame and then you see Cece in the frame but Watts is sort of cut out of it and then when Watts walks away the, the camera sort of moves away to Bella and it's just interesting how it, just in the in the confines of that video Watts is a non-entity even his children are more important than he is in sort of endorsing the product um, what you also notice when Shanann makes this video is she never talks to she virtually never talks to her husband she talks to the video she talks to the people in the video she talks to the one child she talks to the other child it's, it's sort of quite interactive the one person she's not talking to is him and he also doesn't talk to her so let's come back to that question with with this little visual in our minds if you the donkey in the equation what's it like to be stepped on not only that to have the pace set for you while being nagged dismissed and undermined throughout you know what's that like and yeah we're not trying to blame anyone or turn anyone into the victim we're simply trying to say was there a difference in the yoking and we're trying to make that point that's the point that we're trying to make um, and that brings us to point number six good looks and I know that a lot of people don't want to acknowledge this because it seems demeaning but um, it's a very common thing in in relationships is you wonder whether your partner is too good looking in in terms of they might attract some kind of outside interest and they may have the same uh, concerns about you they may have the same anxiety that you have become 
a lot more desirable for whatever reason and is that going to affect them you know it's a completely normal thing to feel in that situation and if you want to talk about narcissism this is where it becomes a little bit relevant is where you say you know what about me um you know what about um you be, you've become really good looking but do you still love me and vice versa um if Chris Watts' personality hadn't changed much since high school, his appearance had. During a sermon on the porch, he presented himself as a neat, well-groomed, all-round nice guy. Although this wasn't different from his performances as a family extra in Shanann's Facebook Live videos, what was different over the years was the grooming. Watts' weight loss was significant. 44 pounds, that's 20 kilograms, in a few months. So he really transformed himself. Um, although Shanann had also lost weight and transformed her appearance somewhat as well, his game in the weight loss and fitness area was clearly ahead of hers. Besides this, just as he was reaching peak fitness, you know, actively working out at home, doing outdoor and physical work for Anadarko and also jogging every day, she was pregnant and putting on weight by the day. No one is saying... That, that that that's her fault it's simply the natural consequence when you're pregnant you gain weight and you your appearance may not necessarily improve and that's really just all that one wants to address here is that the one spouse is sort of um, improving their appearance in leaps and bounds and then the other one becoming pregnant is sort of in a different um, situation and what does that say about the yoking, right? Um, you know, as he was becoming more physically active and physically attractive, she was becoming less active due to the pregnancy. Putting that dynamic into the into the the yoke, suddenly we see him edging ahead of her in the key area that matters for a beast of burden: actual labor in the field. In other words, what I'm talking about is. Um, Chris Watts in terms of his physical activity and his physical um, his physique his muscles in that respect um, they were kind of unequally yoked just in terms of that if you just think of it in a in a very um, reductionist way and, and you think of both Watts and his wife as as two animals like two to cattle, right, to cows or, or whatever, and one of them's pregnant and the other one's not. You can already see a situation with where the one is being kind of held back by that condition, right. And all I'm trying to do here is is just make a series of um, illustrations to show the the stresses on on these people based on this. Um, on this metaphor of yoking. That, that's really all we want to do. We, we, we simply want to acknowledge that there was a lot of stress on the relationship. And I know each time you make it, someone is going, well, I'm on Shanann's side. I don't like what you're saying about it or um, whatever it is. That's not the point. It's, it's not being on anyone's side. It's, it's saying, what was the situation that was going on? You know, what kind of tension was going on? And whether you're on Shanann's side or not on Shanann's side there's a third dimension to um, to this the one dimension is what was Chris Watts's relationship with his wife that's one dimension the other dimension is what was Shanann's relationship with her husband the third dimension is what was the actual marriage like and this is what the whole yoking thing uh, talks about um, when we get to point number seven sexuality we see that um, if the Watts' finances are known, unknown, um, at this point so was Chris Watts' sexuality. Um, the question asked at this time in October was, is he bisexual? And at the time, um, I, I wasn't um, convinced one way or the other. I thought I, there doesn't seem to be much evidence that he's bisexual, uh, regardless of what... Um, claims some people had made. On the other hand, what sort of fit the profile in the sense that he was quite conscious of his appearance 
and he was a little bit introverted so he seemed to it seemed that there was the possibility that there was something there and of course um, there was something there but it wasn't anything to do with his orientation it was to do with his orientation towards another woman right so so what's the sexuality does matter here um, but not so much his orientation um, and th this I did deal with saying that you know w you know what if his sexual appetite was different to Shanann's um, this too would have an impact on the yoking equation seen literally imagine if a yoke donkey is horny and sees another donkey wandering by on the edge of the field um, and in this scenario I said male maybe maybe female who knows and then he tries to head off in that direction and you might think this is a silly thing once again and you know I've had some people certainly on YouTube saying how ridiculous it is to use your imagination in a case that's got um, facts and evidence and what whatever um, and so for people like that please you know leave you know you don't need to listen to this part because it's not going to be factual the, f the the illustration is imagine if you've got two donkeys and the one is horny and trying to get with the other one that's not that's not being in the harness you c it's going to create a catastrophe in terms of you know pulling the plow and it's going to pull the other one in all sorts of horrible directions a again um, this illustration has got nothing to do with the discovery but it it really cuts to the psychology in a very powerful way the visual does that in a very powerful way um, and you know I, I do think that that people listening to this if that kind of thing offends you then please go away because you know that's the, the kind of thing that that is part of uh, my work and my writing I try to understand it in a in a in that kind of way and I know some people don't want to have those conversations I'm not sure what conversations they do want to have you know it's like nobody's a narcissist and um, he was horrible and I hope he rots in jail those people really need to not be here right um, so you know I'm, I'm just saying if you are if you sort of listening to these conversations do yourself a favor you know if you're one of those people just stop you, you're not going to get that ego boost or that that sort of that sense of um, of just being justified you're not going to get it here yeah we try and deal with the um, the people on their merits not on our merits right so you know do yourself a favor let yourself out the door and go to the forums where they talk about narcissism um, and don't come back here you know stay there and 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 enjoy yourself kind of thing um, and and that brings us to point number eight which is an affair uh, there's a saying you lie down with the dogs you get up with the fleas and that's a derivative of the unequally yoked Bible version it tends to be true relative to your point of view if the other person is the dog or the bitch then you the one that's right in the yoking situation not so the problem is everyone is going to see themselves as right and their partners possibly not right enough especially when the you know what hits the fan and the you know what did hit the fan we don't have to know precisely what Chris Watts's sexual proclivities were irrespective of his sexual preferences the fact that he was actively involved in at least one affair while getting his wife pregnant suggests his sexual appetite was significant and that was subsequently confirmed um, it was significant enough to be a factor in the yoking situation certainly there are some suggestions that Watts had an animalistic approach to sex I'm not going to go into that too much um, but one can imagine that there might be pent-up aggression um, merely in the aspect that he was a bottom dweller in the career sense and in terms of his relatively low income compared to the large home and lifestyle really what I'm trying to get at here is in a situation where you push down and you know if you, you, you just again reduce it to animals and one animal just struggling with this yoke and um, you know coming out of each day sort of injured and w whatever 
You can imagine when they released out of the yurt, they might run off somewhere and have a lot of pent-up aggression, um, even sexual aggression. I don't necessarily mean it in a violent way, just that there's a sense of frustration and wanting to be free, you know, in that sense. So the question is, does an affair shift the yoking dynamic in a marriage? It's perhaps the most fundamental symptoms of a couple who are unequally yoked. The third party draws the one constantly away from the other, creating a chafing tension that can become excruciating, criminal, and sometimes even homicidal. And that brings us to the second last um, example, which is his house. You know, do, do you think the house could have created the situation of being unequally yoked? Um, in whose name was the house in Saratoga Trail? This is arguably the most important question surrounding this case. It attends to the crucial interiority. It also answers the question, potentially, of what the prize was behind committing the crime. And that's always something that, that um, one's got to ask, is you've got to say, if this person had gotten away with murder, what prize would they have won? Um, and I don't mean the obvious prize, as in the happily ever after. I mean the financial prize, the what, what's the big um, jackpot for you know, getting away with this crime? And in this case, it's the house. Um, with the house, he's got a place. He's got a place to live happily ever after, um, potentially, or a way to sell the house so that he can live happily, that he can afford to live happily ever after. Um, especially given the fact that if he doesn't sell the house, is he going to be able to keep up the affair when he's he's got no gift cards left? He's got no money left. So this is quite an important aspect. Um, if both of them shared ownership of the largest and most valuable asset, then unequal yoking still comes into play in terms of their respective, uh, respective income and debt burdens. The stereotype MLM scenario suggests Shanann was not able to meet her financial obligations in terms of her share of paying for the house. Let me say that again. The stereotypical MLM scenario suggests that Shanann was not able to meet her financial obligations. And by that what I simply mean, and I, I'm sure that this is going to be a lightning rod for criticism and w what not, but um, it's very well known that um, people who work for MLM struggle, as in virtually everybody. And so, oh, was Shanann an exception to that? Oh, so if she was an exception to that, how come their fin finances were in such a terrible situation. Is there some other reason? In any event, if it's true, then despite all appearances to the contrary, financially speaking, he was the ox in the ox-donkey yoking equation, not Shanann. Let me say that again. If this is true, in other words, if the stereotypical MLM scenario applies, then despite all the appearances to the contrary, meaning all the um, claims that Shanann was, was doing very well financially, she was, she was the, even the more successful spouse, then financially speaking, um, he was the ox, what, or was he the ox in the ox-donkey yoking equation? Who was the ox, right? Someone was the ox and someone wasn't. Um, when we look at what happened immediately after the crime, he called, and, and this information wasn't available at the time of this post. But when you look at what happened immediately after the crime, um, what did Watts do? He called Primrose School to attend to, you know, f collateral financial damage. He called his realt uh, realtor um, within minutes of committing the, the the crime, as in disposing of the bodies. That's how sort of immediate it was in his mind. So one does get the sense that he was um, the ox in the ox donkey yoking equation. 
since we already know the Watsons were in trouble with the Wyndham Hill Master Association, it was clearly the threat that they could lose their home. Now imagine if one spouse begins to blame the other for something as significant as causing them to lose their home. Imagine if one spouse wants to keep a home or wants to not be bankrupt, starts to blame the other and saying, stop doing this, can you help me get the finances back where they need to go? And the other spouse doesn't cooperate. Can you see how that can create a yoking situation? Whatever the truth of this matter, the burden of the yoke that had the Watts' family in its grip, the weight of it was directly related to the enormous debt burden uh, the one or both of them faced. Um, living beyond one's means does that to a yoke. It makes a yoke unbearable beyond one's means. And finally we come to point number 10 which is her health. In other words, Shanann's health. Perhaps the greatest yoke of all was the one only Shanann was burdened with. What's a greater burden, a heavier load on a young mother's shoulders than a chronic and, systemat uh, and systemic autoimmune disease? In upcoming Two-Face Narratives, I explore the health dimension in more detail. And this is obviously what I meant in October. Um, I, think, um, I think the book published after this blog post was Rape of Cassandra and Drilling and Discovery. So, so I think it was Rape of Cassandra that, that dealt with the health dimension specifically. Um, for now, it suffices to note that by placing this aspect in the ox-donkey scenario, the health aspect, no matter which animal is bigger or stronger, having one of them fatally undermined by a serious disease is going to have a huge impact on the suffering of both animals. If they're already e unequally yoked, and we know they were, then Shanann's sickness was a major factor preventing her from being able to pull her end of the plough through their respective field of dreams. And again, this I'm sure will sound terribly unfair to Shanann, but what we're talking about here is in terms of work, right? If one spouse is, has, has got some, you know, serious illness, then over time that's going to compromise that spouse's ability to, to earn, right? Um, one aspect that has definitely been highlighted in a lot of Shanann's videos are, are the sort of notions of her, you know, dealing with inflammation and dealing with her health problems in a setting outside of the home. In other words, working a job and being very unhappy and being sometimes ill and people around her not understanding that. And so you can see how the whole multi-level multi-level marketing thing allowed her to work on her own terms or so she thought it, you know that that allowed her to kind of be at home and you know if she was ill she could lie down if she was um, tired or had a headache she could give herself a break right so it's in that respect that we that we're referring to this um, and and so in conclusion in the Watts family um, you know the believer might rep in, in terms of you know when we say um, let's just let me just refer to this Bible quote it's 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14 and uh, I'm sure Chris Watts would be interested in it now that he's in jail um, you know his letters seem to contain a lot of Bible verses well how about this one be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion hath light with darkness? So in the Watts family, the believer might represent the economically viable spouse and the unbeliever, the one trying to do a con job on about success. The irony is how this arrangement is inverted by true crime. Now we are the believers or unbelievers of whatever Watts says about himself and his marriage. And we are the believers or unbelievers of whether Shanann's world was as thriving as she claimed. We do true crime a disservice if we apply our minds to just one side of the yoking equation. And you know what? This article is written in October. We are now 
um, you know, a year later and you're still seeing um, people applying. I wouldn't even say they're applying their minds. You're just seeing people just gravitating like um, gravy. You know, if you tilt a plate, the gravy just slides to one side. That's sort of how it's sort of happening. Um, it's not people applying their mind. They're just sort of gravitate, as in like gravitate to, to, to one sort of area. And it's what area, if whatever area, um, I, I guess, makes them feel good about their lives. I mean, this case for them is just about projecting their own judgments about someone they don't like or some situation that they're in. That's all it is about for them. It's not about these people. It's about them. And so um, these people are doing this whole case a, a, a huge disservice. If anything, these people contaminate the, the narrative by just ignoring what is actually happening in the case. These same people will criticize me for, for not, um, what's the word, for not paying attention to evidence and not paying attention to the facts when they are doing it um, as a matter of course, right? Um, do you see that? I mean, you know, we have to know both sides to know how each experienced the other. That's the true part of true crime. And to get to meaningful answers, we have to have the courage to ask tough questions about the murderer and his victims. And as long as we do so with humanity, humility and compassion, the real truth will out. Thank you for listening and if you found some value and some insight in this episode, please uh, subscribe to the channel, please uh, ring the bell, like and leave a comment and keep your eyes peeled for kind of a follow up to this particular episode um, and it'll really be dealing with, if this has felt a little bit wishy-washy and a little bit hypothetical and a bit theoretical. Again, bear in mind it was written October 7th. Um, then when we deal with um, Detergate, um, that's going to feel a lot more current. And, and that's where a lot of what has been touched on here applies in a, in a very specific sense in terms of what we know Nicole Kessinger felt and said what we know Chris Watts felt and said, and, and also about Shanann. So again, uh, thank you for listening, and um, bear in mind there's the, the nine-part Two-Face series, uh, all available on Kindle. Um, Oblivion is also available in paperback, and Silver Fox uh, will be out later this month. Uh, will be out later this uh, but understand that at this point I still can't answer questions about the facts surrounding the investigation uh, really all everyone wanted uh, throughout was justice for Shanann and Bella and Celeste we're certainly uh, pleased this seems to be happening I think all of those who were involved never truly believed that you would give us an accurate statement what I can tell you most affirmatively today by what happened before me is the spotlight that he tried to shine on Shanann falsely, incorrectly, and frankly a flat out lie. Is the spotlight that he tried to shine on Shanann falsely, incorrectly, and frankly a flat out lie. Accidental increasing into mid-brand and dark code at $76 a share.